Turn to number 43 in our little song book, number 43. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine own. too long they kept talking to me I hung around here too long after dinner all y'all were gone I think I got home at 15 to 4 <laughs> and I had about enough time to be there a few minutes and I turned right around and come right on back and then I got late getting here so but better late than never uh, anyway it's great to be here it's been, a, it's been a great time I mean I've enjoyed the conversations I've enjoyed the uh, food and uh, the word of God I tell you, Amen. that's the best part of it all, uh, being around God's people and, and enjoying God's Word together. Uh, Brother Greg gave me this. He mentioned this to you this morning. There's some of them back there on the little table as you go out back at the back. And as he told you before, once you use it, pass it on somebody else. Uh, but he's made them available back there, and what don't get gone, they'll be around here for our folks, and maybe we can share them with other people too. Um, but they are back there. I want to let you know that. And welcome you. Is everybody satisfied? Everybody doing good? Room good? Food good? I know the Word of God's good. I don't have to ask you about that. You know that's good. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to stand, and we're going to sing another song. And then Brother David's going to come and uh, preach to us in a little bit uh, as soon as we sing his next song. I hope you're saved. I hope you're going to stand before the throne complete in him. I like that verse of that song. We need to put that between all the other verses and do it on every other one. <laughs> and we're going to do one. I think uh, this song we got from Brother Jordan. Uh, I think he may know who wrote it. I don't know. 
Well, we don't have them anymore. That's clear courtesy of Sherwood. <laughs> yeah. Let's all stand and turn to number 19 in our little song, but number 19. <laughs> <laughs> My soul has found tranquility No longer would I try Good evening, saints. Good evening. Let me just see if this is on. I'll start by saying uh, thanks to Perry and the saints for the opportunity to be here and the opportunity to teach. Really appreciate it. And um, let me open in a word of prayer. I'm going to be teaching on prayer, so you might as well open in a word of prayer. Why not? Father God, thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that what is taught would be beneficial to the hearers. Help us, Lord, to set aside our own traditions. Help us to believe what you have written. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. I'll introduce the topic by saying a couple things. Prayer is a very difficult and often misunderstood topic. There are a lot of myths about prayer that people believe. When you believe myths, when you believe things that are false, it invariably causes problems in life. False, false doctrine is not a victimless crime. Uh, so I'll also tell you that I, my personal opinion, this is just my opinion, prayer is one of the great failures of most grace believers' lives. And that what happens often is people come to an understanding of grace. They were praying a whole bunch of things before that didn't make any sense. And so they stop not only praying things that don't make sense, they stop praying altogether. And the other caveat I'll mention at the beginning is this. Whenever you teach, I'm, I'm aware of this, I'm sure others are as well, Whenever you teach things that are true, you, you always sort of face the reality, I'm doing a really horrible job of living this out, right? And so the, the, the act of preaching is a hypocritical exercise in the sense that you preach righteousness and spirituality and a lot of positive things, and you, you also understand while you're doing that, gee, I could be doing a lot better in these things. So I just tell you that at the outset because you're probably there thinking, okay, well, you have all these thoughts on prayer. How are you really doing? 
And of course, the answer is not that great. So with that, with those caveats, there are three points that I want to cover. Here's what they are. The first point is what it really means to pray without ceasing. The second point is the proper length of prayer. And the third point is inapplicable prayer promises and the Pauline prayer pattern. I didn't realize there were that many P's when I was writing it, but inapplicable prayer promises and the Pauline prayer pattern. So those are the three things we want to cover. With that, get Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. The first thing that we're going to look at is what it really means to pray without ceasing. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You see how the first part of the verse says praying always with all prayer? A cross-reference to that is 1 Thessalonians 5.17. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. If you have a, a scripture memorization program that you're doing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is a good place to start because you'll be able to master this one and then you can move on to harder challenges. But 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says pray without ceasing. Now I want you to notice something. The, the idea of praying without ceasing is not simply a Pauline concept. So get with me 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 23. 1 Samuel 12 and verse 23. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you but I will teach you the good and right way. Now, it's talking there about a sin in ceasing to pray for you. So obviously, it's, it's indicating that he should pray without ceasing for him. Get Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Acts 12, 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So what we've seen is, is praying without ceasing is something that Paul mentions. It's something that's mentioned in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel, and it's something that's mentioned in uh, early Acts, in, in Acts 12, that is something the kingdom church is doing. So that tells you that praying without ceasing is a, a trans-dispensational concept. Now, one of the ways that that's sometimes taught, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it's sometimes taught that prayer without ceasing, that means you should pray every moment of every day. You should pray 24-7, 365. You should always be praying. And I'll just tell you that I don't think that's what it means. Look, there's, a, there's a couple reasons for that, but let me put it this way. Do you want your brain surgeon to be praying while he's operating on you? You might say, well, yeah, because I want him to be invoking God's help, right? So maybe I want that. But let me suggest this to you. Isn't that kind of distracting? I mean, when, when, you, when you're doing something important, when you're operating heavy machinery, when you're performing dental work, things like that, do you want the people that are doing it to be fully engaged or do you want them to be thinking about other things? And it seems to me you want them to be fully engaged. I don't know if you remember this or not. At one point in the business world, there was a focus on multitasking. And what multitasking was, was you can work on two projects at the same time. And this, you know, the, the business world is obsessed with efficiency, and so you can get even more out of people if they work on multiple things at the same time. 
All that is is being distracted. If you want to do something exceptionally well, what you need to do is you need to give it your full attention. And if you don't give it your full attention, then what you're likely to do is you're likely to make mistakes. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that if you make prayer without ceasing something that you do every moment of every day, you're making it a very secondary, a very passive type of thing. Do you remember when Paul says that he talked about people striving with me in prayer? He talks about laboring in prayer. Well, is it something that is passive and secondary and something you can do with a partial amount of your attention? Or is it something that is actually, there's effort involved? I mean, the scripture describes it in a way where there is effort that is required. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you, I, I want to read four verses together. And let let's read them all, and then I'm going to, draw a conclusion from that. So get with me Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at four verses where Paul talks about praying without ceasing. And I want to notice specifically what he says. So Romans 1 verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Get with me Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 16. Ephesians 1 and verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Get Colossians 1 verse 9. Colossians 1 verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And get with me 2 Timothy 1, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers, with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So we've seen that Paul uses the phrase without ceasing four different times. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that if you pay really careful attention to what he said in those verses, it tells you that prayer without ceasing is not a 24-7, 365 every moment of every day. Why do I say that? So I'm going to, you've seen these with your eyes. I'm just going to read parts of this back to you. In Romans 1.9, Paul says, without ceasing, I make mention of you. When he says that in Romans 1, 9, who's the you? It's not a trick question. It's the Romans, right? He's writing to the Romans, and he says, without ceasing, I make mention of you. It's the Roman saints. Ephesians 1, 16 says this, cease not to give thanks for you. Who's the you in Ephesians 1? The Ephesians, right? Colossians 1. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And you know the answer to this. Guess who's the you in Colossians 1? It's the Colossians. 2 Timothy 1, it's the same thing, and it's Timothy. So if you make prayer without ceasing... Every moment of every day, 24-7, 365, then you have, I would say, a contradiction, right? Because then what Paul is doing is he's saying, I'm praying for you constantly. But he's also saying, well, I'm praying for you constantly. And I'm also praying for you constantly. The fact of the matter is that's not what the verse means. What those verses are talking about is that Paul prayed for people and continued to pray for people 
and never quit. In other words, he prayed for them today and he prayed for them tomorrow and he prayed for them after that and he didn't stop. That's what it means. I'll give you another proof that that is the case. Get with me Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Now you might be thinking in the back of your mind, well, you know, what's the point of this, right? Is, isn't more prayer better? So whether it's 24-7, 365 or something less, shouldn't we always be, be praying more? Well, look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees, notice this, three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Well, does that verse suggest that Daniel prayed every moment of every day? No. It says the exact, something different, doesn't it? He prayed three times a day. Was Daniel a fairly spiritual person from the scriptures as best we can tell? The answer was he was. Now, the reason I, I, I go through all this is here's what I have found, and maybe you found this, maybe not. When I was a young believer and I was trying to think through things about prayer, I read different books on prayer because that's what you do, right? If you want to know something, you read a Christian book, and the Christian book will give you the answer. And so I, I read these books on prayer, and the common theme of those books was you need to pray longer. You need to pray more. And people say, well, unless I spent the first two hours of the day in prayer, I couldn't get anything done. And so you read these books, and the idea is, or at least what I found, is, is they would set these ridiculous, and in my opinion, unrealistic expectations about prayer. I mean, I don't know what your life is like. My, I, I don't have two hours in the morning I can spend on prayer. I just don't, right? I mean, there's too many other things that are competing for my time. And so if, if, the, if the expectation to be spiritual, as described in these books, is you have to spend two hours a day in prayer or three hours or whatever it is, I'm just never going to be able to do that. One of the things that is often the case is that men try to be more spiritual than the Word of God. Didn't the Pharisees, for example, do that? The Pharisees took the Old Testament law, and what did they do? There's not enough rules here. The problem with the Old Testament law is there are not enough rules. So we're going to make a bunch of traditions and a bunch of rules on top of that. And what happens with that? It, it, it's a burden that no one is able to bear. And, and that's what happens when you impose man-made ideas of spirituality above and beyond what the Bible teaches. It just becomes burdensome and oppressive. So the first point is simply this. Prayer without ceasing, I don't think, is you pray every moment of the day. I, I, I honestly I just don't believe that's realistic. And, and it makes prayer a very passive, secondary type of thing. What we need to be doing in terms of praying without ceasing is we need to be praying every day. And I would argue the scriptural pattern is how many times a day? Three, based upon Daniel. And, and, it, and if we're doing that, then we're doing what we should be doing. So now let's talk about the second point, and this is the proper length of prayer. The way that I was taught, the, you know, the, 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 the impression that I was given when I was a new believer was, well, if you're serious in prayer, you really want results from God, then you'll pray for a longer time, because if you just pray for five minutes, you're just fooling around, right? I mean, in other words... You know, is, 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 is six-minute abs a real thing, right? You know, in other words, here's the deal. I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I'm going to get a videotape, and I'm going to do a six-minute ab workout, and I do that for a week, and I'm just going to be ripped. Well, you, we, we know that life doesn't work that way. And so then we think, well, the same thing must be true with prayer, right? So if I pray for a, a short period of time, then obviously I'm not, I'm not really serious about what I'm doing. I'm not very earnest. Look with me at Matthew 23, 14. Matthew chapter 23, 14. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm just going to say this, but 
It's a myth, and, and it's, it's even worse than a myth. It, it's false doctrine to teach that long prayer is more spiritual. It, it's just simply false. Look with me at Matthew 23, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now do you see there how it describes long prayer as a pretense? In other words, what is it? It's a show. It, it's done for appearance sake. It's not authentic. It's, it's not real. Now when you look at Matthew 23, 14, I want to ask you this question. What religious practice does Matthew 23, 14 condemn? In my opinion, it, it, it condemns a very specific religious practice. Anyone have any ideas as to what that is? I think it condemns purgatory. So think with me for a minute, if you would. There's a doctrinal teaching that says, when you die, the problem you have is you haven't fully paid for your sins. So what you do is you go to purgatory. It's like the penalty box, right? And you have to stay there for a period of time to burn off those sins. And once you make adequate payment for those sins, then you can go to heaven. It's like this intermediate place, and it's unpleasant. And what happens is those organizations that teach that will say, there are ways for you to reduce your time in purgatory. And so people think about that, and they say, well, I'd like to do that. I don't want to spend time in purgatory. It's a t place of suffering and unpleasantness. Why would I want that? So what happens is if you perform certain religious acts, then you'll have to spend less time in purgatory. Now here's what's fascinating. Matthew 23, 14 is written far before the founding of the Roman Catholic Church. Right? I mean, it's written in the first century. It's that the Lord speaks it during his earthly ministry. And he's condemning a practice that is subsequently adopted, but it tells you that it existed at that time, didn't it? Now let's read it one more time. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour... Why does it say widows' houses? Well, here's why it says widows' houses. Imagine the pressure that's brought to bear. So what happens is you're a widow, your husband dies, and what the powers that be tell you is, let me tell you where hubby is. You know where he is right now? He's in purgatory. And you know what he's doing? He's suffering. But there is good news, and here's the good news. If you pay me enough, I will pray him out of there. What a deal. Win-win, right? He doesn't have to be there. You have the satisfaction of releasing him from purgatory. And all you have to do is pay me, and I'll pray that he doesn't have to spend any time longer there. Now, do you realize how ridiculous that is? Is there such a thing as purgatory, first of all? It's not real. But what a fantastically effective fundraising system. I thought you loved your husband. You won't just pay me to pray him out of purgatory? Gee, what kind of wife are you? For you do what? Devour? Do you imagine the guilt trip that would put people under? So notice what happens in this verse. They devour widows' houses, and what do they do? For a what? It's fake! Isn't that the whole point of the verse? It's as fake as fake can be. But if you're having someone pay you for it, can you say, please let's him out, uh, out of purgatory. We're done. Amen. Well, now that's, that's not a very... You, come on. If you're paying, you want something more than that. So what do they do? They pray longer. 
So you think you're getting your money's worth, but it's as fake as fake can be. Do you see that? Matthew 23 uses the word pretense. Luke 20, 47, which is the cross reference, it says, for a show, make long prayers. What I want you to just get is that often what happens is that long prayer is not because you're having an authentic, sincere conversation with God. It's a show. It's something that is done to be seen. Now let me show you a similar thing. Get with me Matthew 6, verse 7. Thomas Jefferson said, People who read newspapers are worse off than ones that do not because people that read newspapers think they know what happened. Now, what's, the, what, what's my point in that? My point in that is this. The world system is absolutely and utterly full of deception, right? If you watch the news for any period of time, you realize that you are being lied to constantly. That same thing happens in the spiritual realm. Here's what happens. If you're raised in American Christendom, as you matriculate through that, you know what happens? You are just taught error after error after error. And then when you get saved and you come to the knowledge of the truth, you spend the rest of your life unlearning things that you were taught. Isn't that the way that it works? It's, it's how it works. We all have all sorts of nonsense in our minds because we were taught it at some point in time. We didn't study the scriptures. We didn't search them out. We just put it there, and it's been sitting there as a false doctrine that entire time, and it will remain there until we study ourselves out of it. Now look with me at Matthew 6, verse 7. But when ye pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Some folks have the idea that what I should do is if I pray the Lord's Prayer again and again and again, then God will hear me. If I pray it 19 times, he'll be annoyed. But if I do 20, then I'm good, right? Do you ever hear people pray, bless you, Jesus, bless you, Jesus? Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. What does the Bible say about all that? It's vain repetition. It's obviously repetition, but it's not just repetition. What is it? it it's empty. It's vain. It's worthless. Now, what the verse says is they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Isn't that the idea? Well, if I only pray for a couple minutes... God's going to look at me and say, well, you're, you're not really serious about this. If you were really serious about this, you would pray much, much longer. That, that's a human performance-based way of thinking about prayer, right? In other words, I have to earn it. If I only do so many Our Fathers, it's not going to be enough. If I only pray for so many minutes, it's not going to be enough. Let me show you that Paul's practice was very different from that. Look with me at Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. One of the difficulties in praying scripturally is that we have these false ideas in our head that we just have to get out of our head so that we can then understand the proper way to do things. Look at Romans 1 verse 9. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, so he didn't quit, but then notice what he says, I make mention of you always in my prayers. What does it mean when you make mention of something? Do you have to talk about it for a long time? Or when you make mention of with something, isn't it brief? You just make a mention of it. It's, it's, it's concise. Look at me at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, notice, 
making mention of you in my prayers. Get 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And then get Philemon verse 4. Philemon 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. I don't know about you, but, you know, prayers I've prayed in the, in the past is, Lord, I pray for John, and I pray that you would heal him, and I pray that you would help him with this, and I pray that. And, and what happens is there's a whole bunch of information that I feel like I should recite. Do I need to do that? And I would tell you I don't need to do that. The notion that I need to do that is the idea that I would be heard for my much speaking. What I need to do scripturally is to make mention. Let me give you this as an illustration. The proper amount of time to discuss any issue is the amount of time it takes to resolve the issue. So let me give you an example. Let's say that Harry and I have something we need to talk about. And so I say, Harry, uh, set aside two hours. Let's, uh, let's talk through this. It's kind of a tricky issue. So he and I talk about it, and in 15 minutes, we figure it out. We resolve the issue. Well, do I say to Harry, hey, hey, that's great, but listen, we, we had two hours for this meeting, so let's talk for another hour and 45 minutes because that was too fast. If I did that, wouldn't that be a pretense? You know, in other words, if we talked about it and resolved the issue and actually accomplished the objective, simply rehashing it for no purpose, it's just a show. What I'm going to suggest to you is that a lot of prayer is like that. People think that they'll be heard for their much speaking, so what they do is they engage in vain repetition, and it's the exact opposite of making mention. Think about this with me if you would. What was the problem in Galatia? The problem in Galatia was that the Galatians were saved by grace, but then they were persuaded that they needed to please God by keeping the elements of the Old Testament law. In other words, they were, they were saved into grace, and then they said, well, we need to accomplish a performance system to please God. I need to keep all of these rules. And Paul describes that as being bewitched. He describes that as foolish, right? Because, it, th think about this with me if you would. The moment you were saved, you were saved by grace through faith. There were no works you performed. There was no subsequent works you needed to perform to please God. What happens is he accepted you as you were without you bringing anything to the table. Does God now want to put you under a performance system of rules and regulations to please him? And the answer is, he doesn't. What people often do with prayer is they make it a performance system. Prayer without ceasing is every moment of every day. That's what you need to do. And you need to pray longer. And all of that is a, I would argue, it's a fake performance system that is unscriptural and does not actually please God. Let's go to point number three. And I called this in an inapplicable prayer promises and the Pauline prayer pattern. What's my p p point? Here's my point. What people do in scripture all the time is they take verses that are not to them and they grab them because they want them. Let me give you an example. Get 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Before we look at the Pauline pattern, 
I want to look at some things that people typically do, and it doesn't really make any sense. So 2 Chronicles 7.14, this is one of the most famous and frequently claimed verses on prayer today. So read it with me, 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now you know why that verse is so attractive, why people want it? Because they look out at society and they think, man, this place is a mess. And are, are they right about that? They're right about that, right? Do, do, do we need, as a country, as a society, as a world, to turn back to God? The answer is we do. But here's the thing. Notice verse 13. You see how it doesn't end with a period? Imagine claiming verse 14 as a prayer promise. It's literally claiming part of a sentence. Do you realize how illegitimate that is? Here's a following sentence. You ready? I said this, but I didn't mean it. I love you. And if you claim the last part of it, I love you. Do you realize how it's fake? I said this, but I didn't mean it. I love you. And you grab I love you and say, oh, that's so nice. If you, re if you read the whole thing, I said the opposite of that. Right? Yeah. I'm belaboring the point. It is completely intellectually dishonest to claim one part of a sentence. It, it, it's just totally, utterly preposterous, right? Okay. Well, go up to verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. And have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Now, is that useful context? So it's Jehovah God, the God of the Jews, hearing the prayer of the king of Israel. Might that be different from you and me? Now, notice verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Verse 13 is the introductory clause that puts verse 14 in context. So just grabbing verse 14 and saying, well, God's going to heal America because I grabbed verse 14. Do you realize how dishonest that is? Is there anyone today praying verse 14 because of locusts? Where they say, you know what, you know what America's problem is? It's grasshoppers. We have way too many of them. And I'm going to deal with it because I'm going to claim 2 Chronicles 7.14. Do you see how dishonest that is? Now look at verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend. In other words, I'll listen to, notice this, the prayer that is made in this place. Can you even claim this prayer if you live in North America? You can't. Do you realize how completely illegitimate and irresponsible most modern prayer warrior stuff is? Let me just grab a phrase I like, and I'm going to claim it. Here's what I would argue. Are there verses in the Bible that teach healing? Yes. Do those verses apply to you? No. So when you claim that verse, first of all, it's spiritually irresponsible. It's not intellectually honest. So you shouldn't do it. But you know what happens? You wreak havoc in people's spiritual lives. Because you know what they do? You preach that. They believe it. And five years later, they don't have a healing. Well, it can't be the word of God's false because we know the word of God is true. So it must be a spiritual problem in my life. And you end up ruining people's spiritual lives, right? I mean, isn't that true? Uh, aren't there people who have been falsely taught
things about healing and miracles and other things where they sincerely believe them, they try to practice them, they fail, and their spiritual life is a mess? And the answer is that absolutely happens. The same thing happens with prayer. They are taught a false doctrine of how to pray. They pray according to it, and then do they see the results that, the, that they expect? They don't, because the promise was never made for them to begin with. Look with me at Matthew 21, 22. Now, Matthew 21, 22 was a verse I really liked before I was a dispensationalist. I guess I still like the verse, I just understand it differently. Matthew 21, verse 22. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Isn't that great? See, because we all have stuff we want. So Matthew 21, 22 is a great verse to claim. If I just believe and I pray for these things, then I get what I want. Well, that sounds great. I'll commit that verse to memory and I'll start praying it. And what happens? Well, of course, the verse is not applicable to me, is it? Because everything in the Bible is true, but not everything in the Bible is applicable to me today during the dispensation of grace. Amen. What has happened for much of Christendom is people have taken Bible verses that themselves are true, but apply in a certain context, People have claimed those verses outside of the context. They have unrealistic expectations about what will happen, and they end up spiritually disappointed. And that's what happens. So there's a better way. Let's look at the Pauline pattern. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, verse 17. So re let's read verse 16 again. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That those are prayer promises that people don't claim. See, what those verses are about is if you can, you can pray for folks that they would have greater spiritual understanding, but what happens is most of Christendom doesn't want greater spiritual understanding. They want physical stuff, right? The reason why Matthew 21, 22 is so great, it doesn't have any of these spiritual limitations. Whatsoever ye ask, I like that a lot better because there's a lot of things I'd like. And we can start with cars and money and this and that. And so I'm going to, and, and, and by the way, aren't there whole ministries based upon that? None of those folks say, hey, we're going to change course because what we really need is greater spiritual understanding. So we're now going to change and we're going to claim Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. You see the difference? Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. I know there's a lot of controversy about what the thorn in the flesh is. Some people say it's eye trouble. Some people say it's other things. It seems to me if you just read it, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, comma, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So I'll tell you what I think is going on there. You can decide for yourselves. I think the thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. Now, if you think about what God did with the apostle Paul, God chose Paul, made him the apostle to the Gentiles. What Paul did is he went on a lot of travels, didn't he? Because his purpose was to make all men see. Well, if you're Paul in the first century and there's no internet and no radio and no TV, how do you make all men see? Well, you have to go visit them. 
right? Now here's my personal opinion. When Paul writes Galatians 1 verse 6, and he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He marveled because they were soon removed. My belief, you can decide for yourself, what Satan did as a response to Paul's ministry is God saves Paul, makes him the apostle of the Gentiles, gives him the dispensation of grace, the gospel of the grace of God. Paul's going around preaching it. Well, if you're Satan looking at that, it's obvious what I should do. I should have my own guy with my own message. And you know what he should do? He should follow Paul and always be one city behind. So when Paul establishes the church in Galatia, don't show up when he's there. Let him leave. Once he leaves, then go in and teach him false doctrine. And all you have to do then is if you follow behind, you can tear up what Paul just built. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you've ever uh, cleaned a house and you have a toddler, what happens after you clean a room and then you go into the next room and so on? What happens is someone follows along and everything you put in order is reduced to disorder, isn't it? Well, I think that's what Satan does with the messenger of Satan. When Paul prays about this, so read verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Well, if ever there was a legitimate prayer, isn't that a good one? God, I'm trying to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. While I'm doing this, the messenger of Satan is tearing down everything I build. Would you make him stop? A, that seems to me an extremely legitimate desire. Verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. What happens so much with the way that prayer is taught is you claim things. And honestly, some of this stuff is ridiculous. Imagine claiming things. Did, did Paul claim this or did he request this? You see the point? And, and the answer he got was essentially... No, this guy isn't going away. But the good news is, my grace is sufficient for thee. The reason why that is so helpful, and I'm, I'm sorry if this is a spoiler alert, but you know, here we go. You're not going to get everything you pray for, right? And some of the bad situa situations in your life, some of the bad circumstances may remain bad. I mean, just being honest with you, right? Are there, are there health problems and financial problems and other, I mean, there's just there's problems in life. Sometimes they get better, sometimes they don't. What we know for sure is, is God's grace sufficient for you to endure it? Yes. God's grace is always sufficient. That doesn't mean the problem will get better, right? There's people that have health troubles, and sometimes health troubles get worse. They don't get better. Same thing with financial troubles and so on. So one of the things to notice about Pauline prayer is that you're not necessarily get everything that you ask for. Will God's grace be sufficient in your life? Yes, it will. Now, let me say something about that before we move on. Read the last part of verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So let's think about 2 Chronicles 7.14 again. So let's say we have a locust infestation. And so we claim, verse 14, we humble ourselves and pray, God, get rid of the locusts. And so God says, I'll get rid of the locusts. So the locusts go away. What happened in that instance is there was a physical problem. We prayed, and God made the physical problem go away. Well, that's nice in the sense that the problem went away. What God did with Paul is, I'm not going to solve the problem. The problem is going to continue. The messenger of Satan is going to continue to, to do what he's doing. But guess what? My grace will be sufficient, and the power of Christ will rest upon you. Amen. Now, which is better? Is it better for the problem to go away, or is it better spiritually if the problem remains, but now you have the power of Christ resting upon you? 
See, our flesh would say, just make the problem go away, because I don't like problems, and i got plenty of problems to begin with, so I don't need one more. Just make it go away. But it is spiritually better. If, if, if the purpose is to conform you to the image of his son, it's better for the problem to remain and for the power of Christ to rest upon you. That is the spiritually superior result. Now, it's not what we like in the sense that I'd just rather have the problem go away, but it's far better for me if the power of Christ rests upon me. So, next thing I want to cover, and I'm going to call this the real reason you need to pray. We're commanded to pray, so we know we should. But I'm going to give you what I think is, is kind of the most compelling reason. And, and here's what it is. Do you need to pray in order to obtain some new spiritual blessing from God? The answer is no, because Ephesians 1.3, you're already blessed with how many? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So we, we, we don't need to pray to get new spiritual blessings because we already have them. So what is the, the reason that we, we need to pray? And I'm going to suggest this to you. As you think about spiritual warfare, and as you, you think about, well, let's just think about spiritual warfare for a minute. In all combat, there is both mental preparation and physical preparation. So if, in other words, if you're going off to war, is there some physical training you should do? And the answer is yes. You need to do some things to be in shape. You need to do some things to know how to handle your weapon. You know, you need to be accurate and so on. So there's physical preparation. There is also mental preparation. And I'm going to suggest to you that prayer is one of the things that helps you get your mind right for the spiritual combat of life. So get with me Philippians chapter 4. I personally think that the verses that have been most helpful in my life on prayer are Philippians 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. So look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing. And the idea there is don't be full of care. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be burdened. But in everything in every circumstance, in every situation. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So I want to take apart that verse just for a minute. So when it says, be careful for nothing, as you interact with people, don't you find that people are anxious, burdened, overwhelmed, full of the cares of life, and, and typically they are. And that's true for most believers. Well, this says, be careful for nothing. Okay, well, how do you do that? Notice what it says, in everything. In every situation, in every circumstance, in every predicament, what should you do? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Here, here's why it says, with thanksgiving. My personal opinion is a lot of times we are kind of whiners. Here's what I mean by that. The things that we view as big problems are honestly not really big problems. And some will say, well, you're being insensitive and unkind and so on. If you think about life scripturally for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory so make the list of the problems in your life right health problems financial problems interpersonal problems make make the whole list 200 years from now will any of those be important 100 years from now will any of those be important they won't, will they? I mean, after you're in heaven, completely separated from sin, you're spending eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Blessed with all spiritual blessings. I mean, is, is anything down here going to be an issue? No. And what happens is at the moment, it seems significant because it's a bother, right? It's, it's some sort of problem. And in an earthly sense, it might be a big deal. But if you take the long view, does it really amount to anything? And the answer is it doesn't. The reason why that matters, when, when Philippians 4, 6 talks about with thanksgiving, whatever things are the biggest problems in your life, you realize you've already won. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that so? I mean, if, if, you, if you're a saved person, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, you're accepted in the Beloved, God the Father loves you. God the Son loves you. The Holy Spirit loves you. Like, what real problems do you have in this life? Well, I've got, I've got financial problems. Okay, well, I wish you didn't have those, but guess what? Those aren't going to last forever. Well, I've got a life-threatening disease. Congratulations. I mean, that means you may get there quicker. And I'm not trying to be insensitive, but honestly, if we're thinking about this scripturally, which of those things should really unsettle you? And the answer is none of them. You realize what, I mean, you, you, you know this, but you're better off than almost every billionaire on this planet. There might be a few, but not many. Right? Because you've been blessed with eternal riches in Christ. So, Philippians 4, 6, when it talks about with thanksgiving, that is a critical component of this. What I find... Do you ever see the people on TV where they, they claim things and they boss God around and they tell God what he has to do? Do you realize how irreverent an attitude that is? It, God has already blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. For us to boss him around, is it, it's ungrateful and it's just, it, it's basically absurd, Right? So that's why we need to have an attitude of thanksgiving. So notice what it then says, let your requests... So it's not bossing God around. Let your request be made known unto God. Now notice verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's what those verses are saying. We all have situations in life that are overwhelming to us. God, I don't know what to do with this problem. This problem is bigger than me. What happens is we have lots of small problems, right? So I have a flat tire. God, I know how to deal with that. It's all good. I don't need to pray about that. I'll just take care of it. Okay? I'll handle that one. Most of our problems we figure out how to manage because life on earth is full of problems and we get good at managing them. But what happens from time to time is you bump into something that's just completely on your ability to deal with, right? And that's why you might be careful because here's the thing and I don't know what to do with it. So what do I do? Well, the first thing I do is I have an attitude of thanksgiving. Because whatever happens with this problem, it doesn't change the fact that I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. Right? But then what I can do about it is I can make my request known. God, please work in this situation. Because this is overwhelming to me. It's, it's, it's messing up my life. It's doing this. It's doing that. I can make that request known. And then what happens as a result of making that request known now the peace of God that passeth all understanding can abide on me. He said, because here's what I've done. I said, God, this problem is too big for me, so I'm giving it to you. It's now your problem. And I know that you love me. And I know that you can deal with that problem if you want. So if you deal with it and solve it for me, that'd be great. And if you don't deal with it, and don't solve it for me, what will that be? It'll be great. Because you know what will rest upon me? The power of Christ. His grace will be sufficient. So what prayer does, I personally view it as the pressure relief valve of life. Here's something too big for me. God, it's yours. Deal with it however you want to deal with it. I trust you to deal with it. I know you love me. And even if you don't deal with it the way I would like you to, it'll still be okay. 
because the power of Christ will rest upon me. And by the way, in a hundred years, it won't matter anyway. Now, I hope that's helpful to you. What, what, what I find to be the case is that what happens is we have all kinds of unrealistic myths about prayer where we make it a performance system and I need to pray longer and I need to do this and I'm not getting an answer to my prayer because I didn't pray hard enough and then I'm disillusioned and I have false expectations. If you approach it from the Pauline pattern, it's an attitude of thanksgiving it's an attitude where you trust God to handle it and you can have peace because you've committed those things into his hands. So hopefully you find that helpful. I'll, uh, I'll pause there and close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you that you have given us the, the ability to pray. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. And we thank you for everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. We give him all the glory. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.